morning, and thank you all for joining the working group meeting for the Transmission Service and Market Scheduling Priorities Phase 2 Initiative. Uh, this is Christina Osborne with ISO's Stakeholder Engagement Team, and I'll be providing support for the meeting. So we do have uh, Milos Spasonic from ISO's policy team. Um, he's actually going to provide some opening remarks, and then he's going to turn it over to Jeff Spires, who will present on behalf of Vista Corp and PowerX on a transmission services and market scheduling priorities long-term framework. Uh, Kathleen Colbert is also on the line. She's here representing Vistra. And you'll also see several other stakeholder working group members and ISO representatives who have joined as panelists. I'm not going to go through all the names, but they're uh, listed on the right-hand side of your screen. These working group meetings are intended to be interactive, so please raise your hand if at any time you would like to ask a question or make a comment. And just as a reminder, these discussions may not be representations of official company perspectives and should not be treated as such in order to foster open dialogue and sharing of ideas. We will start by taking questions from the panel panelists. Sorry, let me go to the next slide. And then we'll open up to the rest of the stakeholder participants. So um, you can either in WebEx, you can select the hand icon above the chat window to enter the queue. If you've just dialed into the meeting, you'll want to press pound two on your phone. And uh, please start by introducing yourself. Uh, the working group meeting materials and recordings are available on the initiative webpage. Uh, we are recording today's session and we'll post the video file shortly after we receive it from the vendor. And just as a reminder uh, to please ask permission from the ISO before reprinting any related transcription. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the meeting over to Milo Spasonic. Thank you, Christina, and good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, you know, today, uh, as Christina said, we're going to hear from uh, uh, PowerX and Vistra on how potentially an approach that they've put forward of how the different pieces fit together for a transmission reservation process to establish wheeling through priorities across the ISO system. Uh, we really appreciate uh, Jeff and Kathleen taking the time and, and putting together the materials for the presentation. Uh, I, I want to note that, you know, where we've been, we've been, we've covered now, you know, a series of meetings across three different working group topics. We talked about how uh, ATC and native load needs are calculated. Uh, we heard from BPA, SRP, and Idaho on their practices on that front. We also heard on, on practices of those same entities about how they evaluate requests for transmission service across what time frames they offer transmission products. Um, as well as aspects of their transmission planning processes to expand the system in response to uh, long-term requests if somebody needed to uh, wanted to reserve that long-term firm uh, transmission capability uh, for a year or longer across their system. So we've heard across all of these practices of, of those three entities uh, in the Western interconnection. And I think the next step is, and I think this is a good tee off today with uh, Jeff and Kathleen presenting their perspectives but I think the next stage is for us now to take everything we've heard from those entities and the different practices across the West and try to apply them to the ISO and see what is the, uh, what type of a transmission reservation framework would be uh, best to put forward to essentially um, allow wheel throughs to establish priority uh, for wheeling through the ISO system. And like I said, you know, today we start with Jeff and Kathleen uh, presenting on behalf of Vistra and PowerX on, on their perspectives. And as a next step at a future working group meeting, we'll be looking to as well, uh, the ISO will be looking to put forward, having heard everything from these working groups and presentations from the California LSCs and Vistra and PowerX, we'll be looking to put forward uh, and stimulate discussion on a potential framework as well, based on everything that we've heard thus far. And, and we'll schedule that meeting uh, at a future day, and we'll, we'll publish a notice on that. But uh, with that context, I really, again, appreciate Jeff and Kathleen taking the time and putting their materials together. The materials are posted on our website. We posted them this morning. Uh, so as we as they go through it, you know, feel free to ask questions, clarifications um, uh, of them uh, in their presentation. So with that, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Milos. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Jeff Spires with PowerX. And as Milos mentioned, uh, Kathleen Colbert from Vistra uh, is also on the line, and we will be presenting together. And uh, just, just a little bit more background uh, in addition to what Milos already said. Uh, 
PowerX presented and had some, some ideas early on in this initiative um, more focused on some of the shorter term improvements around uh, the existing approach and some additional transparency and, and concepts that could be applied that we uh, put forward uh, last summer. And at a similar point in time, Vistra had also put forward a written uh, conceptual framework for uh, a potential approach to facilitate a forward reservation process for the CAISO. And I think what we realized is that both PowerX and Vistra had some similar ideas and some uh, areas of common alignment, and um, we wanted to bring some of those thoughts in a little bit more detail to this group for further discussion. Um, we've, we've heard the previous workshops that have focused on some of the other TSPs in the West and what their approach is for certain elements of how they, they apply their uh, reservation process and, and their their OAT framework more generally, whether it's native load priority or certain elements of their ATC calculations and some of the other details. Um, and then we also heard a proposal or a concept from the joint California LSEs that laid out uh, some more of a conceptual higher level framework um, on some of those topics for determining native load priority. And it included some uh, ideas on how a transmission reservation framework would fit into the CAISO market. And I think you know, that type of higher level uh, discussion was very helpful to understand uh, what uh, some of the California LSEs had in mind. And so I think this presentation is similar in some ways to that, where um, our objective is to put forward some ideas, some concepts for consideration certainly not a comprehensive proposal, but we did want uh, to provide a different perspective about several of the key topics that we think are important elements of a forward transmission reservation process and ultimately with the objective of trying to ensure that we, we come to a design that supports reliability and promotes competition uh, our, for the transmission system within the CAISO BA. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, at a high level, I think our, the objectives that, that we believe are important are establishing a forward transmission reservation process that allows for open access to the CAISO controlled grid, uh, both for the equivalent of network and point-to-point -point transmission service. Um, and we can get into that in a little bit more detail on what that, what that means. And in a way that's non-discriminatory, non-preferential, and that is consistent with open access principles. And uh, we also would like to discuss the principles and the provisions for that access that are consistent with the policy including around native load priority, network uh, service, and some of those components that have already been talked about quite a bit in some of the previous meetings. So we, we do have some discussion on some of those topics here as well. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. So uh, today's discussion will be, be uh, focused in three specific areas. The first is reserving transmission in the forward time frame, And then the second and third are more in the operating time frame. So once uh, the forward process has occurred and transmission contracts have been purchased, how are those scheduled day ahead in real time? And how are curtailments managed day ahead in real time? Because those are also important elements of how an overall proposal would, would work operationally uh, to ensure it's consistent with the overall objectives and the priorities that are established through that forward reservation process. Next slide, please. Uh, so the first topic we would like to start with is the reserving of transmission in the forward timeframe. And 
the background or the context is that CAISO is a transmission service provider required to maintain an OAT tariff that respects open access. Uh, we think that participating within an ISO market structure should ultimately be improving upon open access and competition and not have the effect of restricting or limiting it relative to other approaches like bilateral markets or, or more traditional contract path tagging. Uh, and, and that's really because market benefits are maximized when, when the rules really ensure open access to this transmission system for all of the entities that are both outside the CAISO and inside the CAISO in a way that's consistent with those open access requirements. And the last point I wanted to make is uh, we think that the rules and the approaches external to the CAISO BA uh, are, are, are helpful in terms of informing a framework that can be consistent with open access and achieve these objectives while still being compatible with the CAISO market processes. And I think what you'll find as we move forward through our discussion is these ideas are informed by the more traditional OAT approaches that are used outside of the CAISO BA. And so some of the language and some of the discussion might include some of the terminology and the concepts that are have maybe not been as directly relevant to the CAISO markets in the past. But that being said, we think that the groundwork is, is there, the concepts and, the, and principles are, are the same, and that the opportunities to use some of those ideas and external concepts and, and apply them to the CAISO equivalent scenarios is a good starting point and a good way to tackle some of these problems. But you know, just of course, to emphasize, we recognize that these ideas need to fit within the CAISO market processes and, and be compatible ultimately with that. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a, a little bit wordy, but really the concept here is that there are at least four categories of transactions that we think are worth discussing. Uh, and in fact, there could be more categories if the CAISO ultimately and stakeholders wanted to explore, uh, for example, non-firm products and, and other service offerings. But at a minimum, we think that there are at least four areas that we should be discussing. And the first one is affording the highest priority to self-schedules serving CAISO load in, in the CAISO BA, um, provided that the requirements are met for meeting uh, primary network service. And, and this is really the topic uh, regarding how to establish native load priority for resources, including imports that meet uh, a certain eligibility criteria. So the first bullet is associated with, with that. The second bullet is the next category, which is forward firm transmission reservations, often referred to as point-to-point -point service. These are the transmission reservations that the CAISO would sell through its forward reservation process. And they could really be purchased to, for any purpose. So, you know, one thing just to, to point out when we refer to things like point to point, that is just trying to refer to the idea that a customer could compete through the forward reservation process for transmission service, whether it was supporting imports to meet CAISO load, exports, wheel throughs, et cetera. Um, and that those rights could be used uh, for any of those purposes. The third bullet is what may be a newer category. I'm not certain that this has been discussed uh, at length in these workshops, but the concept of secondary native load priority. And in the context of uh, the pro forma O, this is a transmission service priority that is lower than the, the firm arrangements but higher than other 
non-firm uses of the system. And so this concept would be another means for load in the CAISO BA to have priority for uh, importing energy in the short-term markets uh, above and beyond other uses of the transmission system, but not uh, except for the forward firm reservations that were previously arranged ahead of time. And so this is something we think warrants some discussion, and we will come back to that, uh, hopefully to make that a little bit more clear in a future slide. And finally, the last category is uh, other uses of the system that are the lowest priority. And these would essentially be um, transactions that have not arranged for forward transmission service of, of some kind. And in those cases, regardless of how those transactions, what purpose they're serving, whether it's imports, exports, or wheel throughs, uh, they would be afforded the lowest priority uh, below the other categories that I previously walked through. So I kind of said quite a bit there, but I think we, we are gonna tackle each of these in a little bit more detail, I think make it more clear what, what we're trying to say on this slide. So I think um, if we move forward to the next slide, there's a visualization that might help. Um, and I, I believe maybe Kathleen uh, was gonna walk through this one, but we can spend a little bit of time here because I think it's helpful just to establish the concept that we have in mind for this discussion. That sounds good. Hey, Jeff, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, and thanks, Jeff. That was all really um, great context and, and setting this up. Uh, so we put, so I'll tee up the, the visual that we have here and we'll kind of both of us walk through it. Um, we wanted to recap essentially what Jeff just went through and show it in a visual format. We are emphasizing this is illustrative. Um, we're just trying to show that there, like in blue, you can see that there are the potential elements that a forward transmission framework might support. Um, and then in green is really focusing on, well, offers, intertie offers submitted into the daily markets so the day ahead of real time that did not go, um, did not make any forward reservation requests um, to secure the transfer capability at a higher priority level prior to those markets. And I'll just kind of go from the top down. The, we're showing five elements here. Um, Jeff mentioned four in the prior slide. Um, there is an asterisk and I will, so when I get there, I'll explain. Um, we've kind of broken the last one out into two possible, but there's a lot of, there is a further policy discussion that needs to be had for number four. And so for the purposes of us walking through this, we're kind of making this a little bit more general and then noting that if, if, there's, if there's substance here that warrants more conversations, um, we need to have some additional more detailed policy discussions in a later meeting. So with that context, I'll start at the top. So the first element would be prim, um, primary native load priority. That was the first bullet that Jeff just walked through. And this could be uh, able to be supported through available transfer capability set aside for contracted imports from identified sources that are the equivalent of designated network resources, those requirements that Jeff referred to. And those are requirements to be sufficiently firm to gain this type, this highest priority. The second bullet discussed is for firm uses of the, trans, um, the transmission system. We've broken this out into two, two categories, a 2A and a 2B. Um, 2A is for long-term firm available transfer capability. And just generally speaking, that's an, we're thinking of that as annual or longer. And this is, would be secured as, through long-term firm service secured or purchased on a first come, first served basis within the firm available transfer capability to support these transactions either to, out of, or through the CAISO BAA. The second subcategory for firm uses is for short-term firm available transfer capability. Uh, generally speaking, that, is, that would include requests for monthly, weekly, daily, or hourly firm uses. This short-term firm service secured could be secured through purchasing 
on a first come first serve basis within the firm available transfer capability remaining in the order of the duration of that request to support transactions again to out of or through the CAISO BAA. This third element is the one that we think um, is potentially newer to this conversation and, and warrants us talking about it and, and has a lot of benefits of recognizing it. And that's a secondary native load priority. This would be afforded through uh, remaining short term available transfer capability if it's available being released to support additional imports to the CAISO BAA at a higher priority than other non firm uses of the system. Number four is we generally are referred to as short term non firm available transfer capability and think we put it hourly. Um, non firm uses could be secured on a longer duration. Monthly, generally monthly, weekly, daily, hourly, uh, but we think that. For the sake of this conversation, we want to focus on the overarching framework. And would like to defer additional policy discussions on what level of interest there is in the granularity of non firm uses, if at all, that this forward framework should support to a later conversation. But if it were to be included uh, conceptually, it would be secured through the remaining short term available transfer capability, if available, released to support additional intertie transactions to, out of, or through the CAISO BAA that are interested in securing this through non firm uses rather than firm uses. Now, the final category is really focusing on offers that are submitted into the day ahead and real time market that did not make any, did not engage in any activity to secure that transfer capability on a, a, a higher priority level. These would be sched our scheduled uses of the transmission system that are without a corresponding forward transmission reservation. This would be afforded in the market optimization, the lowest priority to these types of transactions that are not supported by a forward reservation. Now I'll take a step back and, and see, Jeff, do you want to add any context? Uh, thanks, Kathleen. I, I, uh, I think that was, that was uh, a great summary. I agree with you that more discussion around number four and whether a shorter term non-firm type product is necessary or useful would be worth uh, definitely more dialogue, but that at a high level, the explanation you gave around here is the, the priority for forward reservations either um, achieved through the native load priority provisions or through uh, a forward reservation process. Here's how those would play out. And then you have your scheduled use of the system that doesn't have a forward reservation associated with it that would be of a lower priority than those other forward reservations. I think um, that's you know the conceptual framework. Um, the only other thing I might add is that number one, number two A and two B, once those uh, rights were established, they would all have equal priority through the market. They're all firm at that point. Um, you know, native load priority, as you mentioned, is ATC that set aside for resources that, that meet the criteria for that. The firm reservations are uh, secured through the reservation process and through first come first serve competition for those rights. But once those have been allocated, they're all firm and they're treated equally. Uh, no, thanks Jeff, that's a really good. And just to point um, folks who uh, to the slide where we were trying to represent that detail. If you look to the far right, um, I would give uh, the group the context who's less familiar with and these priority levels that when we think about the priority um, being at the same, let's say, penalty factor level or same value or same um, decision point, uh, seven and six and two are referring to um, in the oh, world, there's, oh, there's more granularity to these because there's more non-firm uses, but the seven is the same priority level. Six is a priority and two is a priority as well. 
just to add that extra context. This is probably a good time to, to take some questions, Kathleen. I see there's at least a couple hands uh, in the queue. Sounds good. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, let's go to Doug first. And then um, if any of the participants have a question, you can either select the hand icon above the chat window or uh, press pound two on your phone if you just dialed in. So let's go ahead and go to Doug first. Hi, this is Doug, Doug Book. Doug Bochin Yone for the Bay Area Municipal Transmission Group. Thank you for this presentation. Um, first, a question Are we talking only about intertie transactions, or are we also talking about transactions within the CAISO, you know, from individual resources to either load within CAISO or load outside? Um, I can take that first. Um, so we are talking about internal generation within the CAISO BA as well. Um, if a export to some extent, um, I think that the focus of our presentation is going to be on the intertie transactions because it's, it's, um, it's the most relevant means of implementing this type of framework, but it is important to, re you know, reflect on like you're bringing up Doug that for an export, it is internal generation that may be backing that export. And so when we get into um, some of the, the later sections on the scheduling requirement, we can talk a little bit more about how um, in detail that this, the value of having that kind of scheduling requirement, how it helps to um, accommodate some of the concerns that we've talked about in the past on that point. But there's also, and this is kind of a van vanilla and apple pie statement, but within the network itself, internal generation that's being dispatched to serve load within the CAISO BAA does have primary native load priority. It's just that it is enforced through the market um, very seamlessly. It's, it's transactions that are needing to be scheduled that are external that we need to focus on how those inner ties get that primary native load priority in addition to internal generation. Um, Jeff, do you want to add anything or clarify? Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. I, I, I think at a high level, I generally agree that at least in our view, the, the focus has been on um, external resources and the imports versus wheel throughs. Uh, and, and, you know, we've, we've referred to exports here too uh, in terms of recognizing that there may be a forward transmission reservation to support any one of those. But uh, I think as Kathleen pointed out, you know, there's an assumption that resources within the CAISO being used to meet load within the CAISO would be, um, would sort of be outside of this framework or at least would be able to be, um, to receive the appropriate priority through the market dispatch. Okay, so they wouldn't necessarily be in that fifth bucket uh, or fifth tier. I mean, because I'm just. Think of it like that. Yeah, I, I I, when I'm, <clears throat> I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna clarify with you. I think of internal generation being dispatched for um, CAISO needs as in the first category, number one. Okay, thank you. And because what I'm trying to, to think about is like the interaction between the market dispatch and and the schedules at the inner ties. And I mean, you know, because Kaiser Load doesn't, I mean, you know, there's a whole deliverability process that's really more attached to the generation resources within the Kaiso. And, you know, the, the, you know, Kaiso is encouraging people to, instead of self schedule to bid, right? If, if the way you re, you reserve your priorities through the scheduling process and it's the self schedule has the highest priority. I think you, we could get into trouble of not having enough bids to clear the market. And then we'd have administrative pricing during you know, the periods when people are concerned about needing the priorities. I don't, maybe you'll get to this when we get to the discussion of scheduling. I think this is a level of 
detail that um, this presentation wasn't isn't geared towards addressing. I, I'm, I don't mind addressing it at a super high level, I, but I, I want to be sensitive to, you know, not getting too far into commercial kind of conversations. Um, I, I think that when you, this is really geared in focusing on if an export is needed to be um, sent outside of the CAISO BAA because it has been contracted, that has, and, and there needs to be an ability for that export transaction to be backed against a higher priority if it goes out and secures through this framework um, a higher level priority uh, transmission um, reservation, which under long-term contracts, that's, that is likely to be a requirement. And I think when you make, a, while CAISO isn't, may want more economic offers, when something has already been contracted, um, it is. I don't think it is as much of a concern. I think it's more likely that a cell schedule would need to be used because it has already been contracted to be exported, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, I, uh, that's helpful. I appreciate that. I, I guess I'm, I'm just thinking through the, uh, I mean, maybe we could come back to this after we go through the presentation more. Yeah, that'd be great. And when we get to the scheduling section, I've made a note on your question so that we can talk a little bit more in detail on the interaction between internal gen and um, the, the intertie transactions when we get to the scheduling section. So we'll revisit it for you, Doug. Great. Thank you. And others. I'm sure there's lots of who are curious. That was a great question. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I did see Milos is in the queue and then Anthony, actually, Anthony, we'll go to you first and then we'll go to Milos. And uh, just to remind you to unmute yourself, Anthony. Thanks for the reminder, Christina. Uh, just one question. Where, where would capacity procured in the RUC process fall here? Jeff, do you want to try and take that one first? Do you want me to? Um. I'm just giving some thought to that. This discussion so far has been on the mechanisms to arrange for transmission service on a forward basis. So before we've, uh, you know, absent the green area, I suppose, where we've been talking about uh, once you're in, you know, you're you've got the market solution scheduling transmission that doesn't have a forward reservation associated with it. But the blue area was intended to reflect transmission that the CAISO is either uh, carving out of the ATC for uh, native load on a forward basis or making available for purchase on a forward basis. And so the assumption I'm, I think that we're making here is that all of those reservations have been made prior to the day ahead market and entering the day ahead market, in which case um, the the scheduled use of the system through the, the markets would be consistent with those forward reservations, whether it's IFM or RUC. So I'm not sure if I'm directly answering your question, but I, I suppose it would depend upon whether that RUC uh, resource that you're referring to had one of these uh, forward contracts associated with it or not. Does that does that help to answer that question? I think it does, which I guess gets to a ma more basic question: is is this basically imposing an ORC transmission reservation framework on every transaction in the ISO? Basically, wheel exports, internal load. Is it going that far? It's not clear to me. <clears throat> I don't believe so. I, I don't think that was the intention. I think we're trying to establish you know, sort of along the lines of the discussion we were just having with Doug, um, a framework for transactions, particularly with, or sorry, for transmission reservations, particularly with respect to 
um, competing uses for the inner ties. And so at least in that's in my mind sort of the what we're trying to achieve with this type of concept. So I don't think it goes to the the level of you know trying to put the entire sort of more traditional boat framework into the KISO BA in general. Um, but you know, Kathleen, I don't know if you if I'm no, I agree. You agree with that or not, but I, I, I understand the question. I don't think we're trying to go that far. I completely agree with that, Jeff, and you know, um, and not to maybe overuse words, but opt-in versus opt-out. Anthony, when I hear the words impose, I hear that you ha are, it's a framework that you, someone needs to be able to figure out how to opt out. And that's not what this is suggesting. This is really an opt-in, um, a forward transmission reservation process that entities could opt into um, and receive appropriate priority for its transactions for in exchange for paying access charges above and beyond. So it is an additional priority level commensurate with um, a cost. And I think that is probably, maybe maybe that's a high level principle to, to anchor in, but I would just reemphasize that this is, context wise would be a new service that entities that need it could pursue, not that it's imposing something on this. If if nobody pursued this, I think it would fairly, it, it would be status quo, which is why I don't see it as imposing. Any other questions? All right, yeah, looks like we have just Nelson in the queue. So let's go to Jeff next, and then also Milos after Jeff. So hey, go good, ahead, morning, Jeff. Everyone. good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. It's Jeff Nelson, SE. Uh, I maybe I'm just uh, trying to make sure I'm, I'm starting at the ground level, the foundational understanding. I may be just sort of missing obvious things, so I apologize, but uh, trying to really understand what what right. If someone gets this, let's look, let me choose one of your buckets, 2A. Why don't we use 2A? What actual rights does this convey to the owner? What 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 what, what does it get the person? What what do they have for, for his obligations to schedule with it? Time of scheduling, what happens if they don't use it? What what resale rights? What do they get for this? So Jeff, that's a great question. We have 15 more slides. So this uh -huh. is really high level questions right now. Um, and the reason I'm just gonna ask you if it's all right if we defer is we have a sure. lot of content um, still to go through and I think it'll address those types of questions. And if it doesn't, um, please ask them when we kind of wrap up the presentation or if you have any. We recognize that Jeff said this, isn't, this is not a comprehensive proposal, but we do have more content on the specifics if you don't okay. mind it. I don't at all. I just let me put one more placeholder. Sure. Hopefully, we can get through this, and it has to do with how do the reserves work with all this proposal? Who, if the ISO sells this firm transmission, are they also selling reserves to back up any transactions that happen with it? And you don't have to answer now, but uh, hope so I can sort of understand how this works together. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Jeff. Okay, let's go to Milos and then we can uh, keep going with your presentation. We'll go to Milos next. Uh, Anthony, I don't know if you, uh, you have your hand up. I'm not sure if that's from before. So go ahead, Milos. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Kathleen. So just a couple of questions, and I think some of the other folks asked similar questions that I was going to, but just um, it sounds like under this framework, if we take it a step higher, it sounds like there. this is, putting forward a transmission reservation framework, and I think you, you clarify that it's primarily, at least at this stage, the focus is on those energized transactions, uh, but it allows for transmission reservations, but also it allows parties to access the system even without a forward transmission reservation, and that's, I think, your, your bucket five or your, your column five here. Um, my question is, is, is and maybe Jeff, I think you maybe got to this. I think you you, you teed this up, but is, is there value in that number four bucket, short-term non-firm ETC, if you have that 
bucket five. Um, I, th I think it's something to keep in mind as we go throughout the discussions. Uh, but the, the more pointed question is, if we're looking at uh, bucket number one, are you suggesting, or, or is this framework putting forward that there would need to be an explicit reservation by, you know, let's say it's a load serving entity that's looking to import RA capacity. Um, are, is that load serving entity explicitly submitting a reservation for transmission service, or are you envisioning that under this bucket one, um, within the ATC calculation, there's a certain amount of transmission that is set aside for native load at those points without necessarily needing a forward reservation for that? Uh, Milos, it's Jeff. I'll, I'll take a crack at that, and, and Kathleen if, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think you know, much like a lot of the discussion in the prior workshops, uh, the, the primary native load priority would be ATC that's set aside uh, ahead of time and carved off from the, the firm ATC that's then made available for bucket 2A and 2B. Uh, I think where, as you'll see in a few, in the future slides, I think where the differing perspectives would be from some of the um, ideas that have been put forward from others is what are the uh, eligibility criteria to allow for that native load priority to be exercised through that set aside. So I think that's where there will be difference, but a difference, but like mechanically speaking, I think the way you said that is, is generally consistent with um, my understanding. And, uh, you know, but I think the other point you made first, just to emphasize, I, I really do think that this concept that we're discussing is focused on intertie transactions. And I think, you know, evaluating it in that context and what will be useful, uh, you know, just along the, just to go back to some of the previous questions around, you know, are we trying to assign a lower priority to internal generation, to internal load or something like that? And that was not the context of putting this together. It was really focused on, you know, for example, what do you do when you have um, an import and a wheel through transaction on the same inner tie? How do you uh, facilitate forward competition to secure firm rights and, uh, to Jeff Nelson's question, I, I didn't fully understand the, the second half of this question, but you know, at, at the most basic level, if you were to purchase firm rights under say 2A, you would receive um, the higher physical priority. If, if you're a wheel through, for example, then you would have uh, the same priority as an import that has uh, primary native load priority to flow if you're both self-scheduling in the same hour at the same inner tie. Uh, and of course, you know, there are obvious other areas, for example, are there economic considerations, CRRs, et cetera, that we're not getting into here, but you know, from a starting yeah. point, these priorities are intended to represent the ability for someone to compete for firm transmission on a forward basis. They would pay the appropriate uh, access charge in exchange for that higher physical priority. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, very helpful. And, and, and I do appreciate that that narrowing. I think it provides you know, a lot of clarification and hopefully a bit less heartburn if, you know, if at least the starting point here, the focus mm -hmm. is on, on the energy. So appreciate that clarification. Okay, no more questions for me, Christina. Awesome, great, uh, great. Thank you so much, everyone, for the questions. Really great. Um, I'm gonna ask to move on to the next slide. And let's delve into some more details now that we've kind of laid the, the landscape. Um, so let's talk about that bucket number one first. Um, primary native load priority. So some context, um, under the pro forma OAT, a network customer or a transmission provider can use what in the OAT, or in the external to Kaisa world, uh, folks refer to as network integration transmission service to serve its network load or native load customers if it meets network load requirements. Um, to the extent network load is not served by a designated network resource, the resource or contract that serves that network load has a lower priority. This, this, um, this multi-tier priority level 
uh, ensures that network and native load customers are only afforded pri the highest priority rights or a, the, the other secondary priority rights we discussed when they make sufficiently firm arrangements. Next slide. The goal of these rules is that, so I'm trying to take a step back. What's the goal of these rules? Um, it, that they should balance between, the, the, there needs to be a balance between the network customer or transmission providers need to meet its native load obligations and the need of other entities to obtain service from that transmission provider to meet their own obligations. A couple quotes that we think are illustrative that we wanted to um, bring the group back to is, one is from order 890, ordering paragraph 1494. So under this paragraph in uh, FERC's order, uh, FERC states that order number 888 has long required the contracts be executed and imposed reasonable restrictions on the types of resources that may be designated as network resources. Um, maybe an additional piece of information kind of map this is, Order 8 came out first. There's, uh, there were additional re requests for rehearings, clarifications, and Order 890 um, was FERC's order to respond to some of the questions on implementation and compliance that, that, en that entities had raised in between the initial open access rules and kind of this, this later clarification. And so when you read this, is what, what FERC is saying is that it imposed reasonable restrictions on the types of resources that may be designated as network resources, um, affirming that earlier uh, direction. Additionally, in the same kind of, or in the same order, or paragraph 1493, um, Kirk also reminded that Congress did not require that the low serving entities be able to take transmission without limitations of any kind in order to serve their native load. Nothing in section 217, um, statute suggests that LSE should not be required to comply with reasonable requirements that are necessary to, to prevent undue discrimination and to maintain a reliable transmission system. And I think it's illustrated just to kind of focus on, well, this is a lot of words, focus on the goal. The goal is to prevent undue discrimination and to maintain system reliability. With that, next slide. So what do we mean by that? How do we, how do, we do that? Um, so to afford primary native load priority, the network customer, and I know transmission provider uh, also, must demonstrate that it owns or has committed to purchase generation pursuant to an executed contract in order to designate a generating resource as a network resource, also from order 890. This next one is just kind of adding clarification from the pro forma OAT uh, sheet 96, which provides additional clarity that the transmission provider, um, which can secure designated network resources on behalf of its native load customers, is also required to designate resources and loads in the same manner as any network customer. Um, the purpose of us providing these quotes here is just to say that if we're talking about the CAISO, or if we're talking about a load serving entity within the CAISO, we can generalize the rest of these requirements to um, the types of resources that are eligible for designated network resource highest priority treatment uh, aligned with firm uses can be generalized to those inner type transactions. Order number 890 also provided some guidance on what types of um, what types of verification or validation is needed to support that off-system purchases supporting um, that have been contracted and or firmed up, said differently, firmed up um, in order to serve internal or CAISO load include a few things. So the resource needs to be able to, it's, if it's an off-system it's an off -system resource, one, um, it needs to be able to identify the amount of power that the customer has rights to. So the, um, the internal network customer has rights from that resource that's off system. It needs to identify the control area from which the power will be sourced. It needs to identify the delivery point that the network customer will take possession of that power. And then it needs to identify transmission arrangements on the external systems to that kind of order. Next slide. 
And with that, uh, Jeff, I'll tee it over to you. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen, the, the last couple of slides that Kathleen just walked through uh, references for precedent and, and some of the quotes that um, that are talking about native load priority. This slide is conclusions that I think I can speak to from PowerX's perspective, and Kathleen may want to weigh in uh, from Vistra's point of view, but really these uh, this slide is about taking a step back and trying to establish the criteria to just really evaluate whether whatever framework the CAISO ultimately uses and the rules that get implemented, do they genuinely achieve open access and foster competition? And I think that's really the, the high level objective here in terms of striking that right balance between native load priority and providing open access for other potential users of the transmission system. Um, in our view, that one methodology that's consistent with what Kathleen was just describing is to exercise that primary native load priority. That should be limited to resources that meet that definition of being sufficiently firm, which is at a minimum that they can be identified and that the characteristics, including the transmission and how it will get delivered to the CAISO, um, should be something that can be identified. And that is helping to ensure that other entities, including the wheel-through customers, are able to compete for the ATC on those highly desired paths during those highly desired periods. And so in our view, what we really want to avoid is an approach that extends that native load priority to an extent where the holdback of transmission on those key paths or in those key periods is such that the third party entities that are seeking service really don't have an ability to compete. And so, of course, as we talked about and we'll get into again, if those entities want service, they need to be willing to enter the queue, compete with others, pay for that transmission service, et cetera. So, you know, we fully recognize that, but ultimately we want to ensure that the opportunity to do that is there in practice. And I think that that's an important outcome that we, we would like to make sure occurs no matter, you know, what the final approach ends up looking like. So I, Kathleen, I'm not sure if you've got anything to add to that. Uh, otherwise, I would turn it back to you to, to keep moving. Uh, thanks, Jeff. I think that's really good uh, level setting. I mean, there's there's more that we could discuss on this, but I'd like to move us through until slide 14, um, so, which will take us through the secondary native load. Uh, I'll, I'll do 12, um, but then open it up after that, because um, I think that'll give us a good point to kind of have, have gone through all the native load priority pieces. So I will start with um, the next bucket. So now the next bucket, which, as Jeff mentioned in clarification earlier on with the visual, would have the same um, loading or scheduling as well as curtailment priority as bucket one because they're for firm uses. But we separated these again into two. So let's talk a little bit about long-term firm transmission reservations. We think it's important that under this dur a durable framework that the forward reservation process includes the ability for entities to seek long-term firm transmission of reservations. Firm transmission service can be used to support imports, exports, or wheel-throughs across the CAISO transmission system. Um, it's, these reservation requests should be made available on a first-come, first-served basis, um, said differently, in the chronological sequence in which each transmission customer has requested service within the firm available transfer capability that has been calculated at that point in time. Entities can submit firm requests into an annual process for a term of a year or more, and if awarded, pay access charges for this term of service. For a request longer than 13, and I should, I think 13 months is probably coming from me. 13 months, generally speaking, is when you look at the, the NERC um, standards, the delineation point. For CAISA's purposes, it could be 12 months, so I should have made this more general. But so for requests longer than a year, 
the CAISO may need to calculate available transfer capability um, outside of what it does on a recurring basis and study whether any upgrades are needed to accommodate the longer term request that spans beyond a year. Um, in addition to kind of the recurring calculation for annual requests or less. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. For forward, speaking of annual requests, um, we also believe this board reservation process needs to support the ability of entities to seek firm transmission service on a short term basis. These also would be able to support imports, exports, or real crews across the CAISO transmission system. Similarly, uh, these requests would be made available on a first come, first served basis, uh, said differently, uh, made available in the chronological sequence in which each transmission customer has requested service within the firm available transfer capability estimated at that time. Entities can submit firm requests with either a monthly, a weekly, a daily, or an hourly duration in advance of the day ahead market processes. So this is all still in the forward time frame. If awarded the reservation, that entities would pay access charges for um, commensurate with the term of service that it had requested. And this is just an, kind of a, a practical note. Of, there will need to be a lot of details defined on how these requests would be the timelines around the, the request when the calculations would need to be performed, made available for an automated approvals of such requests. Um, with that in mind, there of course will need to be deadlines. So that's a reasonable accommodation um, to support implementation of this type of proposal. And just threw out a couple examples of if, depending on what time frame the Kaisen uh, determines it needs um, between when a request is submitted and when it is um, able to be used to secure transmission, this could be this could require those requests to be in 14 days prior for a monthly request, seven days prior to the week for a weekly request, and prior day for a daily or hourly request. And all of those are implementation details, or I mean that we can work through um, if this is something that we want to continue exploring. Next slide. Uh, with this one, Jeff, do you want to go through this one first? Sure. Uh, so we've we've walked through the first couple of categories. The first is native load priority, which would be the uh, carve out of ATC, as we already talked about, limited to resources. When when we're talking about external resources, limited to resources that have been contracted and that are identifiable. The second bucket is firm transmission that the CAISO makes available for purchase, either long-term or short-term. And that could be for any user of the system, whether it's a wheel through or uh, a load looking to import additional energy that, that was not part of the native load priority. But the third, this, this other concept is secondary native load priority. And this seemed as something worth considering in which you know, in addition to uh, developing a forward firm transmission product, the CAISO should consider enabling a secondary native load priority for CAISO uh, load. And what this would, would look like is it would give the CAISO uh, an opportunity to release remaining ATC that was not already sold as, as long-term or short-term firm to support imports to the CAISO at a higher priority than other shorter term uses of the system. And that sub bullet is some of the language that um, in the context of the pro forma out, that uh, it's, it's sort of pulling from that where it's a concept of load being met by non-designated network resources. And so what this would do is it would enable a higher priority for ISO load to use, to be met with spot market imports relative to um, other users of the system that have not secured firm transmission on a forward basis. So if there was an opportunity for an import to meet load in the CAISO BA, on a short-term basis, that would be a higher priority than uh, 
a transaction on that inner tie that did not have any forward reservation associated with it and was just a an inner tie bid that was made in the in the day ahead or real time market. So it would give another opportunity for higher priority uh, even for resources that don't meet the primary native load priority that we talked about under category one. But the other thing I would also point out, uh, as we mentioned before, we think that that primary native load priority is something that needs to be uh, appropriately limited or, or limited in a way that the resources that are um, being assigned that, that primary priority are those that have been contracted for. Um, Kathleen walked, for, walked through some of the other criteria around identifying the source of the supply and the transmission. And so it could be that there are certain RA import contracts that if they don't meet that criteria and couldn't identify the source or the external transmission they're using to deliver it to the CAISO BA, they would not qualify for that primary native load priority. And so instead they would fall under potentially this secondary native load priority because those same requirements would not be applicable. Um, so I, I'll stop there because I, I see that Milos has a question, but I think this was also the end of this section on native load priority. So it's probably a good place to take some further questions. And just a reminder, if you have a question, you can either select the hand icon above the chat window if you just dialed into the meeting, you're going to want to press pound two on your phone. Uh, so, Milos, we'll go to you first and see if anybody enters the queue. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, if we can maybe go back to just the, the starting with the point one, native load priority. I've got a question there and then uh, one question on each one of the subsequent elements. But on the native load priority aspect, it sounds like, you know, as you said, Jeff, it's a carve out of ATC, but it would be only a carve out, it sounds like, if those requirements, those contractual requirements uh, are met. Is there a suggestion that, you know, especially if, if, you know, ATC is calculated a bit further out, I think what we heard from some of the other transmission providers is that you can set aside transmission capacity for native load needs or network load needs without yet having a contract in place. It depends really on the, on the assumptions that you have in place for deriving that native load priority, uh, depending on the load forecast you're using and, and, and the generation dispatch that you're using. But there may be instances where, you know, depending on the load forecast, you may not yet, you know, have uh, generation under contract and, and they yet still reserve it. At some point closer in time, those parties may need to designate those resources, but for reserving ATC, for native load or, or existing transmission commitments for native load, there was, I think we heard that there is an ability to set aside some of that transmission in advance of any of those contracts being executed based again on the different assumptions, the load forecast, and recognizing that you know some of these contracts may not be executed until uh, closer in time. And you don't necessarily wanna leave an imbalance between load and resources that are, that are serving that load. But, wanted to just get your reaction to that and just make sure that I understand that, that the proposal here is that you would only carve out ATC at the inner size, regardless of the time frame that you calculate ATC, only if the contract is in place and it meets some of those requirements that were laid out, and that there would be no room to reserve that ATC or that transmission or set it aside for native load, absent a contract, and then maybe later down the line, uh, you know, some of the requirements kick in, but want to just get your thoughts on, on that and, and just better understand if, if that's the suggestion here. Thanks, Milos, and, and I I would uh, ask Kathleen to, to weigh in on this too, and I know this is a, a, a really important part of the discussion, and I also understand that different entities have different practices, and uh, particularly as you're talking about you know, the planning horizon and looking at um, adding external resources to meet load and how do you account for that? You know, I think um, it's, there, are, it, it, there are different approaches to try to achieve that. When I look at some of um, what Kathleen walked through before, 
you know, in our mind, there is a direct link between uh, native load priority and the equivalent of designating the network resources with the requirements that that resource be under contract to or, or owned by the load and that that's uh, an important part of assigning native load priority when it's appropriate to do so, but not extending into an area that I think is concerning, which is if in effect the outcome results in carving out the ATC in order to facilitate future market purchases. And I think that's where it gets to be a situation that we don't think is consistent with the FERC precedent or the objectives of, of really enabling open access. Um, and so, you know, based on that precedent and what we see, we think that the most appropriate approach would be to say that these forward contracting requirements need to be met to enable that native load priority. Um, otherwise, the, the load in the CAISO BA could either participate in the firm reservation process like any other user or use the secondary native load priority that we were just discussing um, to the extent that there's further transmission available on that given inner tie. Uh, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Kathleen to see if she has any additional thoughts on that. Yeah, no, thanks. And thanks for, um, I do, I think it's a great question, um, Milos. I want to provide some additional context for the process of kind of putting this together. Um, Jeff and I talked a lot about like what would be most beneficial for this initial conversation and wanted to keep it really high level. Um, in the course of, of, of it, uh, we, we identified a few things that need to be deferred to later conversations because it does require more granular level policy discussions. And this is one of them. So the two we identified were really, is there a need for non-firm uses, yes or no? Um, and the second is, well, what's the devil in the details on the ATC calculation? Um, that itself, we could have done, because I tried to mock it up, I can tell you like 30 slides, um, and we just didn't have time for it in this conversation. So the way that I have been thinking about it is, if, if we have some consensus that this is a conversation worth continuing to have, I'd like to have another meeting where we go through and focus on the ATC piece and, and what is appropriate there. And the, but my initial reaction um, to the question is, you know, from VISTRA's perspective, we acknowledge that some inclusion of load growth is appropriate on, for a native load priority for a set aside in ATC, as long as it's reasonable and it does not disrupt the appropriate balance between native load requirements and open access for other parties. That is really the punchline of this. Uh, and it avoids undue discrimination. Um, there is, I think that when we get into maybe this next working group meeting on the ATC in more detail, if we decide we wanna pursue from talking about this, then we'll carve out time to have that conversation, pun intended. Um, the reason I think it needs a lot more time is it really depends on which elements we want to work on. Um, if you say there's no, you know, if the CAISA says we don't want to do anything more than a year, then that's a very different conversation on what types of flexibility there is than if you said, well, we need to have rules that contemplate five year out requests or two year out or even a year and a half. Um, and so I think we need to get some more. Um, comfort with continuing to have this conversation before we start getting into um, exactly how load growth might be uh, accommodated um, in the, the different ATC calculations at different points in time. Does that make sense? Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, I, I just wanted to acknowledge, I guess, for the broader audience that, that you know, we've been hearing throughout our discussions and presentations that as Jeff said, there's different methods of doing these things and different approaches that parties take for setting aside transmission for, for native load needs. Uh, some of them may not require a contract depending on the time frame. So just wanted to acknowledge that, that that's out there as well and, and appreciate that response, Jeff and Kathleen. Um, just one question on, on point 2A, I think it's a slide maybe 13 or so. Um, if you can go, there we go. Um, or maybe it's the next one. Uh, 
so I, I think you were suggesting, Kathleen, uh, transmission service down to the hourly level. And I, and I recognize, again, we'll, we'll need to get into some details uh, later down the line on this. But uh, I'm just not sure how, I, th I think we'll need to consider where the buck stops, at least on the ISO system. Is it, is it down to the hourly transmission reservation process? I'm not sure how compatible that is with, with certain aspects of the market. But also wanted to acknowledge that the hourly firm product is not necessarily a, a pro forma per firm product, meaning that I think parties can choose to adopt that product, at least on the old framework, um, if they see a need for it. But I think the pro forma goes all the way down just to daily. And, and I, I just see some challenges with the hourly concept um, at, at the ISO system. So that's just a comment. And then on slide 14, just wanted to one more comment or question on, on that. And I think, Jeff, you, you, you raised the connection well there, and, and as you're familiar, we've had some of these discussions as well at, at the CPUC level. But um, that last bullet there, that, that there are some implications here along at least secondary network load, set secondary native load priority on this slide, that there are some potential implications here on, I think throughout here on the on the RA products and, and the timelines of resource adequacy uh, showings, um, certain amount of contracts that have to be shown in the annual time frame versus the monthly time frame. But this one also implies that certain types of RA imports that may not have uh, you know, a source specified or may not necessarily be delivered on a particular type of transmission um, may also, may not qualify for native load priority, but rather uh, under that point number one, but rather would fit under the secondary low priority in your, in your, uh, in your uh, scenario. So that, that's just a comment, no question, but something for us to keep in mind, I guess, throughout this, how does resource adequacy fit into it and does the framework that's being put forward with certain contractual requirements that have to be in place, certain contractual requirements that have to be met, how does that comport with the RA program? And is this approach driving or requiring changes to the RA framework in order to make it fit with the transmission reservation process that's, that's being put forward? But I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. And... Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, this is Kathleen. I really appreciate those comments. and, and that... It's something that I'd like to respond to because I think the elegance of this proposal that is not requiring changes to the RA program, um, it may incentivize transactions that are offered to LSEs under the RA program to be higher quality, which overall is a big um, advantage and benefit that the California, um, that the CAISO could see from this because it's incentives rather than a requirement. Um, the other thing that, so I just keep that in mind, I really do see this as, as providing additional incentive structures on kind of more the commercial activity side to consider whether or not entities could provide a greater, you know, competitive advantage in offering their services to load service entities versus others who aren't willing to take those kinds of actions. And so this is, you know, it's one of the things that I find elegant from a, a system reliability perspective. The other just caution I would give is that this proposal does not contemplate, you know, take really interacting with RA um, or the RA processes. It's separate and distinct the way that at least I'm envisioning implementation. Um, so there may be overlap, but really the transmission rules themselves would be set up in independent of those kinds of considerations. And then in the registration process, have to um, meet those requirements to get the higher priority, but it, it, it's specific, at least in my approach, and I'll defer to Jeff, this proposal is intended to be separate and distinct from RA, although I do think it sends some really nice incentives uh, to that program to be more firm and better support reliability. Jeff? Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. I, I agree with you that this is not, um, th th that this proposal is separate from the RA requirements, but I, I agree with what Milos has said, and that's why we we raised it here, is that um, it could have an impact on how RA resources are treated, in particular, 
if um, if import RA rules allow contracts that aren't supported by an identifiable resource or transmission, then they could be treated differently because they wouldn't qualify for that primary network or primary native load priority. And so, um, you know, as Kathleen pointed out, you know, that could provide a, uh, an incentive for import RA contracts to include that information, but, you know, it's not a requirement per se, but certainly import RA contracts may be treated differently depending on whether or not they could meet that necessary criteria to get the primary uh, native low priority. Thank you. Christine, I think we can move on to uh, some other questions. Yeah, we'll go to Jeff Nelson next. Hey again, uh, and again, I, I, I really wanna make sure I'm understanding this because uh, it's, I hope I don't understand it. So what I'm hearing you saying is, forget about load growth, but in order for California to have priority access to its own transmission, it has to arrange transmission contracts outside of California to, to specific resources or resource groups. So the only way California gets priority access to its own transmission is by signing contracts for transmission with other balancing authorities. Do I understand your proposal? I think that that is, if you go back to slide, uh, I've forgotten which slide it is now, I don't have it in front of me, but the slide that identifies the criteria for essentially designating an external network resource those would be the same criteria or similar that would be used here for CAISO to receive native load priorities. So I think the simple answer to your question is likely yes, unless Kath Kathleen disagrees with that. Um, That's Kathleen. really helpful because I'll just have to say that uh, I strenuous, strenuously object to this proposal. I think it's an absolute non-starter, and frankly, I don't think we should spend any more time discussing it. Thank you. You didn't even let me. You didn't even let me chime in, Jeff. Uh, slide seven. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I appreciate. It. I heard that. Um, I think that a few answers that I give is that I think this illustration about it added it is really helpful. Um, primary native load priority is the first bucket, and it would be an eight, included as an ATC set aside. Um, I absolutely see that as providing the highest priority access to load serving entities um, to secure transmission system through the set aside for sufficiently firm resources. I think what counts as sufficiently firm, we've put forward um, the, the, the FERC orders on open access as a starting point. I think that this is an implementation detail. And I just strongly incur, I mean, not implementation detail. It is a, a conversation that warrants additional policy discussions on what requirements would, how that would be refined and, and documented and detailed. Um, I just encourage us not to throw the baby out with the bathwater until we have that additional level of conversation. If you have sufficiently firm resources, then it's a set aside for primary native load. From a system reliability perspective, though, Jeff, I think, Jeff Nelson, I think that you are incentivized to want to have sufficiently firm resources so that the resources you've converted with are able to support reliability. So I, I really don't want you to walk away from this proposal thinking that what your hope is is inconsistent. It's just that we need to get alignment on what sufficiently firm is. I don't disagree with what Jeff Spires said. Um, I just wanted to know that there, that it would have transmission, it would have some kind of transmission requirement, and we need to kind of continue going through those details. Well, um, a transmission I, access yeah. conversation is not a resource adequacy design mechanism. Correct, this is you're, separate and distinct from that. You're proposing the ISO adopt the rules of the Northwest Power Pools Resource Adequacy Program. That's a separate conversation than transmission. I am, I'm, I'm definitely not. We need to conflate not, those two issues together. 
I mean, I, we're talking about access to transmission that California's already paid for, that we don't have access unless we pay someone else for permission to use our own transmission. It's just, it's just not nonsensical. Respectfully, Jeff, um, I'm, we're not conflating anything with RA at all. As I clarified with Milos, this proposal is separate and distinct from the resource adequacy program in California. What I was explaining to you is that you have incentives that I just encourage you to recognize that you have incentives to secure resources that are sufficiently firm. So I don't see this proposal as inconsistent or as something that isn't worth pursuing. I also think this proposal is deeply rooted in open access and equitable access to the CAISO's transmission system. And I would not lose sight, encourage not to lose sight of the elements that we're referring to here as other firm uses would also be paying for transmission access. And those transmission access charges is a later com policy conversation as well as to what where we allocate those funds. Um, a lot of what you're raising, it merits additional conversation. Um, we, we do think that this has a lot of merit, supports overall reliability and avoids undue discrimination. Uh, Jeff Spires, you wanna add anything before we move to the next question? Uh, thanks, Kathleen. I think that was that was a good explanation, and I, I think you know just to back to what we'd been talking about earlier. I think we're trying to find that right balance so that California load has the appropriate native load priority to bring in contracts from other systems, and that we recognize that, but do so in a way that. Uh, is also consistent with providing the ability for other customers to compete for transmission service across the CAISO network. And that's fundamentally what we're, we're trying to get to. Yeah, I do see, uh, it looks like Alan Mech has his hand raised. So let's go to Alan first, and then also uh, Chris Devin is in the queue as well. So Alan, go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Alan Meck from San Diego Gas and Electric, and I just wanted to second Jeff's uh, vote that we not spend any more time on this proposal. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate hearing your perspective. Um, I will just echo again that in order for a durable framework to be defensible, it needs to support open access. Rules have been recognized. This proposal is attempting to thread that needle and encourage the Kaiser to, con to consider it in light of these con comments that if additional conversations can be held, we can work through some of these more granular level policy discussions. Thanks. Okay, yeah, Alberto, let's go to Chris Devin and then we'll go to Anthony Zonkovich. Okay, sure. You'll hear a beep tone when your line is unmuted. After that, please proceed with your question. Your line has been unmuted. Hi there, this is Chris Devin with Customized Energy Solutions. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, hi Chris. Hey Kathleen. Um, yeah, so I, I, first I'll have a question and then a point. I think question on kind of at the risk of getting into discussion because I understand the debate here. Uh, a little bit that's been ongoing. And I think, you know, I, I don't want to risk trying to take you guys off the rails here, but I do kind of want to just pry into maybe some of the existing RA concepts a little bit, like the, the concept of the maximum import capability. And I think this 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 whole process does actually overlap with the RA program and it needs to overlap with the RA program. So I, I just want to provide another perspective here and just say that in my mind, it seems like the MIC is a set aside that's very similar in my mind to, to primary native load priority service here, number one, and that you could use that somewhat as a proxy for something like a set aside for a firm ATC in that sense. And, and I think that might be one way to maybe secure or, or bridge the gap between, I think, maybe like what SCE, SCE is saying and, and perhaps, you know, the, this viewpoint and, and that there needs to be some consideration of the internal provisions and programs for import RA and, and that, you know, without majorly overhauling that whole process, maybe that could fit in here in this proposal. And maybe if you identified how that might fit in, it could be helpful. And so that's just an idea and maybe a question if, if you guys think that might be 
something worth pursuing or discussing further. Jeff, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, thanks, Chris. Appreciate that feedback. And I, I think I agree that um, the MIC allocation would would need to be evaluated in light of pretty much any forward reservation f framework that's ultimately put in place. You know, whether it's something like this or something different. So I think just the need to evaluate the MIC process is a, a really good point. As would be probably other related areas like um, CRRs and any impacts that might stem from that and the interaction of having a forward reservation process with uh, both your CRRs and MIC allocations. Uh, I, I don't think that I'm um, in agreement, at least just thinking off the top of my head, that the MIC allocation would serve the purpose of determining the native load priority. Um, because I think that starts to be challenging insofar as um, sort of putting the carve out first before the contracting occurs rather than the other way around. Um, but that being said, uh, I think your point in general is taken and something that would, would definitely need more consideration. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. I, I just throw it out there because it seems like that might be a starting point to maybe have some, you know, type of uh, uh, agreement or, or, you know, horse trading on this a little bit, because it does seem like that's been primarily the, the previous, you know, uh, uh, concept that we've used for essentially setting aside that, that capability for the use of native load by the LSEs, you know, in the past. And so may, maybe it's not, I, I hear you on the, the ordering of the contracting and kind of do the designated network resources. Um, but so I guess that that leads pretty well into my other point which here, which is just I think there needs to be some give and take on both sides of this discussion, in my view, because it, it feels like there's the the, the existing provisions and, and process and, and reser lack of reservation system and use of MIC in the, in the RA imports space and all of these concepts have been put in place back when we started the, the, the market and there was an idea that there was enough slack on the system. Uh, uh, for transmission and, and for resources that it wasn't necessary to maybe do some of these other concepts that were in place in the other areas. But I do think that I will just say I see that this this more of a forward transmission reservation framework that looks a little bit more like the old world that you guys are presenting here does have some merits that seem to line up with how other regions do things in my understanding of how like MISO and PJM and other areas do and some of the stuff that Milo should, has actually presented um, you know, back in the, the earlier stages of this. Um, and I do just note that, you know, we did bring this whole concept up through the initially through the MIC, uh, uh, you know, initiative and, and then, you know, obviously realized it had a lot more touch points and other things like the CRRs you mentioned and other things, Jeff. So, um, I, I think it, it, there is, I just would say I would vote for, you know, more discussion on this should be considered because I think we're going to have to get somewhere that's in between both these sets. Um, I'll stop with that. Thanks. No, thanks, Chris. This is Kathleen. I, the, some extra really like, context I'd add um, to kind of crowdsource with the rest of the stakeholder community too is that we were kind of referencing like when when things were initially set up. I personally try to remind people when I have kind of offline conversations that when things were set up, the use of the transmission system was really different. Um, so it's important to note that the existing paradigm was set up at a time when um, there was an expectation that there was sufficient transfer capability across the KISO system in, out, through, um, to support competition um, for that transfer capability, both from both for native load purposes as well as for um, external entities seeking to, um, let's say, wheel, if, for example, wheel through the KISO system. It was expected that there was sufficient headroom to accommodate that through the market's um, operations. And I think consistent, I, and I, it's my personal view that what Mick is doing is not setting aside use of the transmission system for native load. Really, the transmission system is optimized under, to, under today's implementation. It was expected there was sufficient transfer capability, so there was no set aside necessarily performed for this purpose. Um, I totally agree with you, though, and I want to just say, clarify the way that I interpret it is there was not a set aside of transmission. It was assumed to be sufficient. 
The MIG process is providing, in my mind, and I know there are more experts on the panelists, so feel free, um, but trying not to get too far into MIG, but I see it as really ensuring that the amount of RA that was transacted to be provided from external off system sources uh, does not exceed what the system can support from a deliverability perspective during times of need. And so I really see it as more of a deliverability check and a cap on um, not overly transacting with external resources if a simultaneous um, transfer cannot be supported by the system rather than a set aside. So small clarification there. But I think it's, I mean, from my perspective, but I think it's a wicked good point um, because where, how we set this framework up back, you know, back in the day was hinged on there being sufficient transfer capability. And as a group, I think it's prudent and, and just fair that we all recognize that that assumption is no longer true. Under today's um, operations, the CAISO doesn't have sufficient transfer capability to go to for all entities, both external and internal, to compete for that transfer capability uh, on an open access basis, which is why we were confronted with curtailments of, of different intertwined transactions. And we have these additional risks confronting um, internal entities, external entities, et cetera. Um, and so a lot of my, you know, our perspective is that we need to recognize this reality. Um, since the price of controlled grid is now being oversubscribed uh, and there is not sufficient capability, we think it's now necessary to explore how to provide these longer term opportunities to reserve this capacity on an open access basis that avoids undue discrimination so that there is an option for entities that opt into this type of framework to um, schedule on those higher priority levels in the daily market. It really does hinge on, we're not where we used to be. Our operations are different today. Jeff, you wanna add anything before we move on? Uh, no, thanks Kathleen. Uh, yeah, it looks like Anthony has his hand raised, and then uh, Milo should re-enter the queue. And Alan, I'm not sure if you had your hand raised from before, if you had another comment that you'd like to make. But we'll go to Anthony first. Uh, one uh, question and one, one comment. Uh, I assume that uh, bucket number one includes things like CBM and TRM. That is, that is, that is correct, Anthony. Okay. And just, you know, a general comment that I think this has come up in the last several comments. Uh, you know, I think we do have to recognize that we're not starting from scratch. You know, this is not sort of, you know, an ISO that hasn't been formed yet. And we need, I think, to find a way to all get together and make this work, you know, given the framework that we have and find a way to accommodate uh, you know, for some forward transmission reservations without undoing the entire system and everything that's been done for the last 20 something years. And I think that's the challenge. And I think it's gonna require all of us, you know, to put our, get, put our heads together and see how you can sort of meld the two concepts together without, you know, completely undoing everything. So I think that's a challenge that, uh, we're going to have to, you know, really work on as we look ahead to getting this achieved. Heard, understood, and acknowledged, Anthony. Thank you. Um, I, before we move to Mila, just a quick time check. We've got like 22 minutes left, and we do have two more sections. Um, so with that disclaimer, Mila. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, we'll move on. Just just a couple of quick quick notes. Uh, I, I think what we're hearing throughout this discussion is. Um, the reservation process should work with existing processes that we have in place, including the RA framework such that resources that are procured under that RA framework have the ability to establish that, that priority, um, you know, rather than, you know, excluding certain potential resources from that based on the requirements that are input. And I, I think that's something we, we have to talk through and, and walk, walk through. But the other thing I wanted to know, just when we're talking about some of the requirements under the oath for designating resources, I think there's also the concept that you don't necessarily have to meet the, the firm upstream transmission requirement and specify the source um, if you're taking title at a particular, you know, depending on where you're taking title to the resource. So if you're taking title at the 
point of interconnection between DAs. Uh, you know, I don't think that that requirement is in place for firm transmission or or the source specification requirement, which I think is a bit more flexible when considering different types of arrangements that may be in place. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge that as well, and 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 that that's. I, I think I think that the, the slide that, that talks about point one and some of those requirements may be a bit more rigid than you know requiring or, or acknowledging the concept that FERC has also noted that you depending on where you take title to that generation is uh, where you have to demonstrate some of these requirements. So that that may be also a little bit of room to work with uh, if this is not the path that we want to evaluate uh, down the road. Um, Milos, thanks. For, I I just wanted and I don't mean. Um, I actually do think those requirements does not preclude that. Um, so that's restrict from the order. Order also include. I mean, what you're saying is is accurate. Um, I, please don't read into that slide anything that is not specifically on it straight from the order. That is an additional policy discussion on what the requirements specifically should be that we're hoping to have at a later date. Um, but it doesn't actually say anything more than what you just articulated. Hope that helps. All right, Christina, I think we can, uh, I think we can move on. Great. Uh, yeah. Oh, awesome. I'm going to, oh, we, do we have more questions? Sorry, Christina. No, that was just me. I just wanted to make sure I was on the right slide. Cal. Oh, yeah, you are. Okay, I'm going to plow through 15 and 16. This is the kind of the remaining ATC. Um, so if in a later policy discussion, we confirm that entities want to pursue forward reservations of non-firm uses, um, the CAISO could release this uh, remaining available transfer capability not already sold uh, to support intertie transactions to, out of, or through the CAISO, the AA, at a lower priority than the secondary need of load priority. Further discussions required, as we've mentioned multiple times, um, we think it seems reasonable to consider whether to make this available um, for a reservation request that can be confirmed prior to day ahead market. Uh, scheduling required for non-firm hourly requests should be considered. Uh, we just would like to have that at a later date um, in more detail. So it gives folks time to think about if the non firm uses is something that as an external entity, whether a marketer or an LSC, they would be interested in or not. Uh, next slide. That brings us to really the bulk of this is the, the, the kind of, I, not the bulk, but the, the, the punchline is that what are we left with? Um, and kind of back to Anthony's, is it imposing? It's not imposing. We are left with transmission schedules uh, without a forward reservation. So self schedules um, referencing forward transmission reservations would receive its corresponding priority through market processes. The lowest priority for self schedules would be afforded to all day ahead and real time self schedules offered into the market. Um, self schedules cleared in Kaiso markets, but not supported by a forward reservation will receive this lowest priority than those backed by forward reservations. Um, but higher priority than self schedules not previously cleared. All I mean by that is a day ahead self schedule not backed with a forward reservation clears the case of market. When it feeds into the real time market, it will have a higher priority in real time than a new real time self schedule without a forward reservation or a day ahead reservation. Um, would, and again, open question would other reservation types other than non firm point to point be useful or necessary uh, for entities wanting to seek those instead of? Um, opting in for the lowest level. With that said, can we move to the next slide? Given time, I'm going to suggest we start uh, going for the next section rather than opening up for more questions. Um, Jeff? Sure. Thanks, Kathleen. I'll go through this quickly just in, in light of the time. So, um, you know, we, we've now moved through the, the discussion of the forward uh, reservation process, and I do appreciate all the comments, and I, I respect that there's differing opinions, and some of them obviously strong on in terms of what the right solution is. And I think to you know some of the Milos's recent comments, there are, are definitely details and variations in approaches, and so you know fundamentally, I think still, as I mentioned a couple times, what we really would like to see is the appropriate balance uh, between. Uh, native load priority and open access and, and trying to find ways to achieve that. But as others have said, I think, you know, there's clearly more work to do to try to find a workable uh, approach that meets those competing objectives. Um, and the last couple of slides we had were 
really thinking a little bit more about the operating time frame, frame. so day ahead real time, kind of what, what scheduling requirements would help support this. Um, and so, yeah, as I mentioned, there's, you have a forward process for reserving transmission, but how does that transmission get used? How does the customer um, gain the pr priority that they've purchased? Um, and how do you achieve that? And so, um, first point is that w the scheduling requirements are, are what would be needed to validate schedules and affirm that priority before you run the market so that you know who's using what. And um, e-tags would play that role in terms of specifying the transmission reservation that would be submitted for a given market run to gain the priority. So that would be the tool to schedule on a forward tr transmission reservation. Uh, because what that would do is it would give the visibility for the CAISO to assign the appropriate priorities and the uh, via penalty prices to valid schedules that are using those, essentially what are equivalent to network or point to point rights. And that would allow uh, the transmission reservation information provided on the ETAG to, uh, it would support CAISO to identify what are the appropriate penalty prices because ultimately those reservation priorities would need to get translated into penalty prices for purposes of dispatching the market. And uh, maybe it's kind of obvious, but those penalty prices then would also um, have to be structured in such a way that they would respect the relevant curtailment priority of those different reservation service levels that are assigned. And, and we'll talk about it at the end. Uh, next slide, please. So um, using this approach and, and submitting e-tags to provide this information would give uh, the CAISO's approach more consistent consistency with what other TSPs do, which is you submit an e-tag uh, from the source to the sink, and then each of the TSPs evaluate that transmission and to the extent that it's valid and it has the appropriate reservation IDs, then they consider that segment to be used. Um, and so that would align the CAISO's e-tagging approach with what is standard practice uh, across the West in terms of scheduling uh, forward and day ahead transactions. And it also gives an improvement to the CAISO operators by providing them with the visibility of what transmission capability is being used and uh, provides them a, a, a means to measure whether or not those schedules are valid and actually uh, going to be made available. Um, a, a sort of related note is it also ensures that there's a consistent demonstration by someone that's seeking to schedule that they're, uh, they've got the resource and transmission arranged across the full path before they get the high priority uh, schedule, but also before the CAISO displaces or curtails other schedules. And this was something you know, we raised as a concern, even in the context of the uh, interim solution where there is a risk of, without this, the CAISO displacing a legitimate transaction, uh, whether it's an import or a wheel through that's been tagged and has you know, supply, et cetera, arranged, there's a risk that that gets curtailed in favor of a transaction that may not have a, a physical resource behind it or a transmission. And that that is, doesn't seem to be a good outcome to the extent that the case was curtailing schedules um, to make room for others that may not ultimately show up. Um, so this type of arrangement would be beneficial in terms of providing that consistency and ultimately it would result in a comparable treatment both for wheel through schedules and RA imports, which is you know, obviously another area that was debated when uh, the mechanics of the interim solution were being worked through. 
Um, last thing, just from an export perspective, it would allow um, some means for entities to su successfully schedule export energy during key periods. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now just quickly on the curtailments. I think we all know that the, the CAISO markets are striving to the extent possible to respect self schedules through the optimization and avoid curtailing them. But of course, all of this really is uh, focused on those instances when uh, the CAISO has to make an adjustment or a curtailment to those self schedules in order to resolve congestion across the system. And so I think the, the concept hopefully that is straightforward is that the priorities that are uh, arranged through the forward transmission process would be respected through the curtailments and through the penalty prices that result in those curtailments. So that would be basically following the curtailment priorities uh, set forward by NASB and NERC. And you know, I think obviously these are details again that we need to work through, but basically the same concepts that we were showing before around firm translates into a 7F priority um, the secondary native load priority would be a, 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 the next level down at a 6NN, and then you would go down from there. Um, so basically this would just be a detail, but an important one that would ensure that the curtailment priorities match uh, the intended order of operations when you have to make curtailments in a particular period. Next slide, please. That might be the last one I forgot. Oh yeah, one more, sorry about that. Uh, I think this is the last slide. So, you know, again, I, I already walked through most of this. We need penalty prices for valid schedules to match the appropriate priorities. Uh, that would start with firm. So you would have the primary network service that was arranged for through the native load priority as well as any firm reservations that were made, those would be curtailed pro rata as firm schedules. The second highest priority would be other imports arranged to the CAISO BA that would receive the equivalent of network economy, which is priority six. And then as Kathleen has pointed out several times, whether or not there are other lower priority forward transmission reservations or not, on the inner ties uh, is something that would wor be worth discussing, but ultimately uh, the lowest priority would fall with respect to inner tie transactions to day ahead or real time schedules that are bid into the market, but not supported by any forward transmission service at all. Uh, those would be deferential to the, the others that we listed above. Uh, so again, you know, details that would need to get worked through uh, I believe that's the la last slide we have. So I'll stop there and ask Kathleen if she has any further comments. Otherwise, we could probably take a couple more questions before we run out of time. Uh, no, I think just one co quick comment and then like to leave it for questions is that, you know, as I heard you say something which is worth reemphasizing the scheduling requirement to add an e-tag scheduling requirement prior to day ahead still has value even if a forward reservation process doesn't move forward, um, and you know, specifically for if the CAISO needs to make judgments in an, an out-of-market adjustment process, which we introduced fairly recently, last couple of years, um, it could aid that process. So just wanted to emphasize that there's still value there regardless of that, um, and then turn it over to questions. Kathleen, though, I, I'm sorry, just one other quick point was, um, some of these discussions on scheduling and curtailment too have also been coming up in the EDAM discussions because that's another area where um, there are rules uh, necessary to work out how EDAM will function. Um, and that touches on a number of areas, but one is resource efficiency requirements and how to validate uh, schedules being used for resource efficiency between BAs, but also just transmission, um, the transmission between BAs being used to support uh, 
potential EDAM transfers, and how do you put all of those pieces together in that context as well. So I think some of these concepts in these later slides would be applicable uh, under EDAM and, and worth debating in those forums as well. I don't see anybody with their hand raised. So just, uh, just a reminder, you can either select the icon, the chat window, the hand icon, or if you just dialed in, you'll want to press pound two on your device. And I'm not seeing anybody in the queue. Did you have any uh, final comments, Jeff or Kathleen, before I turn it back over to Milos? I do, uh, unless you want to go first, Jeff. Oh, please go ahead. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank the group for uh, allowing Christina for helping us to set this up. Thank you so much. Um, and for everyone to engage in this conversation. Um, ooh, I've taken lots of notes, um, appreciate all of the feedback and suggestions. I wanted to reemphasize that we really see this as a starting place of, of putting forward principles and that we we hope that we have a chance to and there's an interest um, on part of the Kaiso and others to keep talk, having this dialogue and delve into some of these details because honestly like the ATC thing itself is an entire two hour meeting. Um, look forward to having and kind of delve into more of those details. Um, with that said, and some of the other comments about from Anthony on, you know, we don't, we're, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. The intent of what we're putting forward is, is a proposal that we believe integrates with the existing processes that the CAISO is performing in some way. Um, additional conversations on how those would be integrated, I think is what I have thought through as the next tier level of conversations. But it is intended for it to leverage existing functionality, existing studies, existing calculations, and make enhancements to them. So when I thought about next steps, I think a really good next step is having a working group meeting um, that I would characterize as, okay, now what are the ATC calculation enhancements that we would need to explore to support this framework? Um, another meeting would be, or another conversation, because I really do think that would be a two-hour meeting. Another meeting would be, Let's have a policy discussion on what um, whether non-firm uses are needed in a longer uh, a forward reservation process or not, so that we can come with some clarity and feedback from the stakeholder community on that to help inform this durable framework proposal. Um, another issue raised here, well put, is how does this integrate with the case's existing studies? That's a thing I think you know Milo has done a great job of having folks come in and give background, which makes clear that that's an, a conversation we need to have, just as it's one that would be another working group meeting on how do we do that in the CAISO. Looking forward to having those conversations. I hope you take this uh, in the spirit it's meant to, to be furthering our market design um, to kind of protect that delicate balance we've been talking about um, in, a, in an open access and non-discriminatory way. And I look forward to having those deeper conversations, hopefully in a few more meetings that we could set up, um, if this is something that we want to keep talking about. That's all. Jeff, okay. Did you have any oh, sorry. I'll just add thank you uh, to the CAISO and for everyone for, for participating, and I appreciate the feedback, appreciate the questions. Uh, there were some good ones, and, and thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Yeah. All right, Christina, this is Elish. Maybe I'll, I'll jump in and, and again express our gratitude to uh, to both PowerX, Jeff, and, and Vistra, Kathleen. Really appreciate you walking us through this, putting in the time and the effort. Um, I think, as you both said, some good questions have been raised throughout this, but I think this gives us a good sense of, you know, what's out there and what a framework could look like. Um, you know, even, we have to work through some issues, as we've noted, too, but, but I think it's a good starting point for discussion. And so what we're going to be looking to do next is, similar along the lines of what you suggested, Kathleen, now that we've kind of walked through what we've heard from others, uh, how they do certain aspects of that process, both from the ATC reservation and the planning perspective, we're going to look now to facilitate upcoming working group discussions to talk about some of those discrete elements. I think we'll dedicate some time to talk about how we could calculate some of the native load needs and the inputs 
um, and the different components of the methodology. Um, then focusing on the reservation process and the types of products, I think you give us a good starting point of something to consider. Um, and, and I think we can then build on that and, and work through some of the issues that we've heard and the interplay with other processes and other frameworks and other, you know, the resource adequacy program. And then the third, I think, component is looking at the, the planning interactions and the expansion element of it. But that's what we'll look to do next is facilitate some of these discussions now. How could what we've learned uh, apply to the ISO? And having heard also some of the perspectives from yourself and kind of California LSEs um, have a robust discussion on that. So really appreciate you both taking the time. Really appreciate the good discussion and the good questions. It's a tough issue, but uh, I think we'll have some more discussions on it here in the coming weeks uh, in the working group. So. With that, Christina, I'll turn it over to you to close this down. Great. Yeah, and when we do uh, schedule those meetings, we will issue a notice uh, with the details. So um, once we you know, confirm some dates, we can send those out. And then again, the uh, presentation, Tarix and Vestor's Peace presentation is out on the initiative webpage. Uh, it's linked here on the slide. And if you have any follow-up questions, uh, feel free to just email me at the um, either of the email addresses address was listed on this slide as well. So thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your participation in these working group meetings and have a great rest of your day.